really. It's uh, it's always difficult following Tim because uh, that's a really quite inspirational presentation. Some of the things that uh, he's doing around the integrated modelling, the things that we're trying to do in City Hall as well. But I'm looking at that and thinking. Wow. And uh, I really abide by those principles as well around openness and not keeping uh, this sort of work locked in a vault. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> gladly. Um, right. I'm going to talk, um, as we've just heard, about London. And, and, and I suppose, um, without giving you a full CV, um, traditionally it was my job to sort of understand London. That's the simplest way I can describe it. I ran a team of, sort of statisticians and social researchers and economists and, uh, and people of that ilk. I don't know whether they'll have jobs in a few years' time based on, uh, based on what Professor Boyd was saying. I'd be interested in that uh, with regard to myself as well. But more recently, um, um, I've been sort of taking responsibility for this thing called SMART in London and how we achieve a smart city. And that's been done on the basis of the work that uh, we've done around London Data Store. And I'm tasked with talking about that today. I'm going to talk, with, talk first about London Data Store and the journey that we've been on. And I'm going to try and keep that as brief as possible because I think what people are interested in in the room is what we plan to do with London Data Store to the, um, going forward so that people like Tim can use, and indeed anybody in the room can use it to access data that will make for a better city, a, a, a smarter city uh, in the marketing language. So that's what I'm going to talk about over the next few minutes. I'm going to do that brave thing of trying to flick to the internet, probably with disastrous consequences. We'll see. Um, so anyway, um, I've been asked to address this question about what the London Data Store is, is, is for. Um, it was set up in 2010, and really it was set up around this sort of political narrative of transparency and accountability and, 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 and making data open. Um, it um, was revamped uh, about a year ago now. There's 600 data sets on there. I'll be completely frank about what it is. I mean, you probably will have heard the story about Transport for London and lots of the sort of transport applications um, that have been generated out of it. That is the closest that we come to, I suppose, what is near real-time data. It's a very sturdy, very extensive, um, but quite static um, catalog of data that is very largely drawn down from uh, drawn down from government and uh, public, public sector data sets. I'll go on when I talk about the future to, uh, uh, to emphasise some of the ways in which we want it to change um, in the future. Uh, but a really quite sophisticated back end on it now. It, it, it doesn't fall over. Um, it has this dashboard on it um, as well, so you can see lots of sort of interesting things there about sort of the state of London's economy, the state of the transport system, and again, this is not sort of dials moving around minute by minute as this sort of um, swirling mass called London changes. Um, it is, you know, it's a robust. Um, you know, lots of data on things like the housing market, which is hopefully valuable to people in the room. Um, but we do want to move it on. Um, I often make the point, and I think this is important, and I'm, I'm really sort of enjoying the way that data is coming much more to the fore and much more into the policy making process um, than has been the case in the past. Um, the London.gov.uk website, sort of corporate website for, um, for city government, um, London Data Store constitutes about 20% of all the traffic that goes to that site, which tells you that we are not some sort of dusty data sinecure that nobody really pays that much attention to. Uh, we um, you know, are really proud of the way in which the site tries to interact um, with its users and engage, um, and lots of visualisations on there that people can look at. And we get about 40,000 visitors a month now, and that's people drawing down data to do the sorts of things uh, that, that Tim was talking about. It's used by lots of public servants, lots of consultants um, in, in their work as well. So it's becoming, sort of, uh, I think, really quite an important sort of part of the... Um, um, a state, I suppose, in terms of how, uh, how how data is used, and again, you know, things like the London Infrastructure Plan, which I'll go on to talk about, sort of help to further cement the place that data has in in in, in the way we form policy in the city. Um, I just want to talk quickly about some of the sort of ways in which the data on there is used. Um, we are trying through things like the London Connectivity Map to properly sort of shine a light on the way that um, 
um, the market provides you know, what people often call one of the sort of new utilities, digital infrastructure um, in this city called London. And that is just taking what data we can get from the providers. It's also trying to sort of crowdsource information as well from, from the recipients or the supposed recipients of, uh, of connectivity in the city, be they businesses or individual households, and to try and sort of um, take to the market, um, or to, sorry, take to the suppliers. Um, a view on where the market feels that, uh, that, that, they're, that they're being let down. There's things like the London Schools Atlas that I'll talk about in a moment, but I suppose sort of emphasising the heritage of my team before I move on to the future stuff, there's a whole host of sort of demographic data um, that, that, that you'll see on there that we present in sort of myriad clever ways at really, really detailed um, lo local level as well. And then, of course, there's the things um, that are produced out there in the ecosystem. This is City Mapper. Um, so this is one of our sort of export stories, I suppose, which is uh, where a private company uh, has been born out of the data that transport for London. Uh, there's nine, nine million journeys um, a day um, that are collected on the Transport for London website and, uh, and developers can access that data and they've used it in this instance to create a company that now sort of exports its services um, to New York, Paris, Berlin, um, out to the Far East as well and there's huge potential. Um, I mean we talk about this thing called sort of government as platform. I think the thing that I like about City Mapper is as a platform it allows for the overlaying of more and more and more data. Things that you could like discounting services for high streets is one of the ways in which I think you know, City Mapper itself can sort of add to what a pretty impressive services uh, that, that we already see. This is the London Schools Atlas, and this is me starting to talk about the way in which we are sort of using data um, and can continue to use data to sort of better understand the way in which the city and city services work, uh, work for the 8.4 million Londoners that we've got out there at the moment. Um, serious point here around the harmonisation of data. Um, it's one of my bugbears, and I'll come on to it in a moment. Um, we have 33 boroughs in this city, and they collect data on all manner of services, or uh, and, and some of them publish some of that data, but it is collected in a different way. Uh, sometimes there are private sector contra contracts that hinder the release of some of that data. What we did with the London Schools Atlas, and why I'm showing it, um, is achieve a bit of a breakthrough. Um, the Department for Education, um, one would hope, um, hold data um, for uh, schools places provision across London, but they collect that from all of the boroughs, and it's them who do, who do the harmonisation of that data. And this is critical for interoperability in the future and the Internet of Things. And again, this is in my sort of semi-static 2015 world, but it's a sign about where we want to where we want to go. And we managed to get that data after sort of many long wranglings around licensing agreements. Again, that's a point that's uh, quite close to my heart. Around, uh, around schools provision in London. It's a massive problem. We need 20,000 extra schools places because of the increase in population um, that I won't dwell on. Uh, Professor Boyd was talking about it earlier. Um, and it's important that we can give parents as much information as we can about the schools that little Johnny and Jane could potentially go to. So this contains, yes, things like um, schools performance data, but it also <laughs> contains based on, again, some of the more traditional work of people in my team, the demographers who do the population projections, it contains, prop, uh, it contains population projections and translates that into the pressure that will be um, brought to bear um, on local schools in, 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 in an area. So you can see a few years down the road how, um, how, how um, or, or the sort of choice that, 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 that you might have and the standard of education that you might receive. And of course, with the marketization of the education system and the academization uh, that, that we've been witnessing, it, we also want it to be a tool that helps those parents, those companies who are sort of broadening out that education provision as well. It's important to know, based on where population is going to be um, in the city in the next few years, where it's best to place schools. And again, that's quite a sort of politicised issue, and we've seen a few examples of where that has gone well and gone not so well. But again, it's, I think this is quite important. It's a sort of democratisation around an important area of policy 
based on you know some harmonised data for a city like London. And again, some of these things are sort of like madness, and it, it's so it, it's so simple, really. Why would you not, in 2015, in a city like London, be able to look at something like education, which is a really important policy area across the piece? We have to have sort of harmonised data that uh, that supports this kind of enterprise. Um, this is uh, sort of my London. This is uh, th this is due for launch at the moment. The one thing about the data store at the moment is, I say, it's a great catalogue, but just like a library, you have to sort of walk around it and pick books off the shelves um, to to do, to do your research. So, if you want to know, sort of know about a local area um, in a great deal of detail and draw down data across a whole array of data, you haven't really been able to do it at the moment. And the simplest way that um, that I can describe this is that. Uh, the purpose of setting up these high-performance APIs that enables you to scoop data in from a range of data sets is that it sort of starts to provide, I suppose, a private sector Zoopla or a private sector um, right move. And those are sort of great facilities, and they do show you things like, um, like education provision, of course. But what we're doing here is stacking in a whole load of other data sets from those 600 that I mentioned. And you can start to look at things like air pollution, things like crime. Now, I mentioned that those, those, are, those are, um, crime rates, those are quite negative things, of course, but we think it's important with regard to planning the city, looking at its future and how we can better serve people, that those things are available. Um, and that's obviously not something that sells homes. So it's not something that you'll see featured in quite the same way on, on, on those sorts of websites. Um, here's the what next bit. Um, I do think, as I said, that we're a bit of a that we're at a bit of a moment with regards to data. Um, open data is the thing that you will hear people like me talking about lots and lots and lots. That's a sort of the, the man from the government's, I suppose, quite traditional view. I'm really keen to push something that I call city data um, because of lots of the things that you've heard, particularly in Professor Boyd's presentation at the outset. You know, this city is suffering, or not suffering, but it. it it is presented with significant challenges with regard to water provision, electricity and, and power supply, uh, as well as some of those things that sit in the more traditional sort of public services sphere. Uh, and then, of course, there is the data that we as individuals, which, we've, uh, we, 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 which was touched on as well, could be brought to bear in a way that improves the, Im, improves the way that the city functions. So I think that means that we need this broader encapsulation. Lots of issues around that, around things like data privacy. Um, I take part in something called the Connected Digital Economies um, um, Trust Framework exercise, which is where we're trying to sort of um, open up the debate in a new way um, with citizens. And again, I think that's something that's quite important for city government to do. Um, I think it's vested in us to improve the lives of people in this city. Um, this, um, if, we're talking about, if we're talking about smart cities, there is in that inherent, I think, um, the notion that, increasing, uh, that smart cities will be increasingly personalised places where more personalisation around services can be delivered. But that means that we need to build that greater degree of trust in, indiv in, in, in individuals and households. Again, hugely exciting things that we can do around um, energy markets, for example, and the way in which we sort of help people to sort of better use domestic energy and manage domestic consumption better. Um, I, I, I was talking at, at, the st at the start about a sort of water provision as well, and you know, we, we, we think, I mean, look out of the window now, we think rainfall, because it's so abundant in, um, in London and the South East, um, supplies us with enough water to, uh, um, to, to, to keep us uh, fed and foddered, but that's not the case. I, I, I think, and you, you'll know far better than I do, that we have a sort of water shortage situation potentially on the horizon. Again, we need to better educate people on the basis of data and, and putting it in their hands in a way that allows them to use it um, to minimise um, or use more effectively the, um, the water supply that they have. Um, so. I am really keen on this thing called city data. I think there are things that need to sit around that, things like data standards and the BSI and Future Cities Catapult are doing a lot of good work on this. So are, um, um, uh, so are other standards bodies as well. Um, I'm, re um, I'm really aware of the interoperability of data as well. I mean, I've been talking about data harmonization. That to me is a more static thing. The interoperability of data that initiatives like Hypercat and again other standards standards initiatives are bringing together is really quite important and it, 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 it's an area that we're watching quite closely and indeed in areas like Old Oak Common which is a sort of significant development area in the city uh, you know, we're, we're, we're working with them so that we are as IOT ready as we can be. Um, 
Ah, what's gone on? Have I turned it off? Brilliant, that's the end. <laughs> there we go, it's come back on mercifully. Um, I, I was speaking about broadening out the amount of data sets um, that we put on data store and not making them so much off government. Just a couple of really quick examples of the sorts of things that we've done here. We've got 150 million lines worth of UK Power Networks data up on data store at the moment. Again, this is a sign of the way things that can be in the future. At the moment, it's a static data set. It's based on an experiment that ran over a couple of years. 5,000 um, 5, households taking part in, in a domestic en energy management experiment. We've sort of opened all that data out, um, up there. It's smart meter data collected every half an hour. It's there for people to use. Bromley Healthcare, again, I think the thing that we do in this city or that we've got a tendency to do or have done in the last couple of years is get really quite exercised by this thing called infrastructure. And that too often is, as you know, it's, it's the hard hats, it's the high-vis jackets. But actually, a lot of what we can do with data is around the public services. And Bromley Healthcare is a uh, relatively small non-profit organisation, used to be part of the NHS, no longer are delivering public health services. There's really big issues around health and social care integration. We need to better understand how patients can best access services. That's the simplest way that we can put it. But to do that, we need a proliferation of healthcare providers to supply us with data. And of course, there are arguments that we have to take there, just as in the case with the energy markets around competition issues and how you can share data rather um, securely rather than just in the first instance make it open and again i i think that's quite an important stepping uh, stepping stone that we need to that we need to look at can we flip over to the um just quickly how do we do it is it a tab one of the things that we have done is that's it thank you and this is where uh, we start to become really quite relevant with regards to what um, uh, some of the previous speakers have been saying is, we know that we've got big um, population pressures. Uh, we know that we need to keep the sort of socioeconomic fabric of the city in as good a state as we possibly can to remain competitive in comparison to some of those other global cities. What we've never had really in London before is a stronger understanding as we have now on the basis of data um, of the infrastructure and the pipeline and what that's going to look like in the future. So we created this thing on the back of the London Infrastructure Plan called the London 2050 Infrastructure Map. And what you can see here is the sort of many thousands, and we've re received really quite sort of strong cooperation here, which is encouraging, from the utilities, from the developers, around all of the sort of development projects that are in the pipeline. Some tiny, you know, some of those sort of pocket homes that pop up all over London, some significant infrastructure projects. Um, but the idea here is that we are really trying to improve the coordination, the planning, the delivery of infrastructure in the future. Um, so here we have all the sort of planned and projected development activity. Uh, you can look at um, the pressures that that could potentially create on the energy supply, on the water supply. You can overlay that. You can see here we've got um, the sort of demographics tab. Again, that's where the more traditional work of my team comes in. So just like with the school's atlas, you can start to see the potential demand that is, uh, that is being uh, forced on the city over the next few years or over the next few decades on the basis of projected population growth. Um, and um, what was the one final thing that I wanted to say about this? Um, I think on the demographics tab, you can start to, yeah, you can start to sort of use these sliders. And the idea with this is that, you know, there's clearly a more complex version that sits behind it that can be used by the city modelers and planners. But you can also, um, if you are more akin to your average Joe, you can start to move some of these sliders along, which shows, the diff shows how if you change job growth or population growth and other inputs, you start to create greater pressure and greater demand for infrastructure. And this will be, do this will be expanding over, over, over the current months and years. Um, just to go back to the presentation, and I think we're very nearly finished. Which one was it? Sorry, give it to the experts. Right. Um, One of the things that we also want to do with data store is move it out of the sort of catalogue um, status that it is today. This is one of those sort of techno utopia diagrams <laughs> that people put in the front of large European Commission bids. Hands up, guilty. Um, 
But this is um, um, for our integrated infrastructure horizon 2020 bid, where you know we are creating or in which we want to create a sort of city operating platform. So this is to be sort of marshalling yard, I suppose, um, for all of the data that will flow off the connected infrastructure, be that transport, um, local energy management, smart grids, um, electric vehicles, so on and so forth, um, that we know will, uh, you know, will, will, will come about in the future. So we do have a plan for how we sort of flip this out of the catalogue, out of the static data, which is, again is hugely valuable, but we do recognise that this is probably where the future lies. Um, one of my concluding points, which I've sort of covered already, but I did say that it was one of the things that I really want to crack. Um, in a city of this size and this complexity, where the governance is difficult, where we have 33 boroughs with lots of politicians and lots of uh, public ser service managers, I, I think we have to reach a point where for issues like social services, refuse collection, recycling, we have harmonised we data sets, we have um, interoperable data sets ready uh, for the Internet of Things. Um, so that we can sort of drive efficiencies and just make public services better, um, because you know, the public policy issues that we all that we're all aware of, they that they really pay no attention to these artificial boundaries that separate the individual uh, the individual London boroughs. So we have to have a sort of mature city data sort of I said, uh, city data economy, and that's one of the reasons why. Again, it's quite a thing that the man from the government would do and suggest. We're writing a strategy, we're writing a document, but we do think it's an important time. It's an important moment where we need to be a lot more sophisticated than simply saying, here's some open data, mark it, get to work with it. I think we need to be a lot more deterministic about the things that we want to be addressed through that data, uh, the city challenges and opportunities, and how we work with the supply chain and provide the right sort of motivations, the right sort of incentives, and there I don't think regulation's a bad word. Sometimes, sometimes it is, but I, I, I think it is about, this is about shaping a sort of city data economy, and that's super important. And these really, I, I shall finish, these, these are my sort of watch words. City Hall cannot do this on its own, that much is clear. You know, I, I did a, a submission to the uh, Science and Technology Select Commission, uh, sorry, Select Committee in Parliament <coughs> on, uh, on, big, on, on the big data opportunity, just because it really felt like a time at which city government should be laying down some ambition and also being crystal clear in what it can and cannot do. We have skills gaps. You know, I could talk about do we, don't we need data scientists? What's a data scientist? Um, we probably do need a little bit more capacity of that nature, but these are the things that I think are really important. Supply, harmonisation, common standards, uh, city be being more deterministic, and having that mature debate with citizens who, you know, there's a quote from Shakespeare, isn't there, about what is the city if not the people. And I think Professor Boyd, was it you, who said that it will be people who make or break some of the technology. And I think that's the point <coughs> I'll end on too. Thank you. Thank you.